intelligence, API, how are we going to make it work? And this is where myself and Jason would be presenting how possibly we can make it work, at least this time. I'm working with Capgemini in the UK markets as, as part of the digital architecture team, and looks after the public sector accounts and the CPRD space about how we can make the transformation program successful, but also bringing together the agile frameworks across the globe as well. I would like to introduce Jason as well. Yep, yep. Hi, and I'm Jason Gain. I'm a digital architect working in public sector, and we've been working in a quite highly agile environment for the past two or three years. And so we've learned quite a lot um, within our, our roles about uh, some of the challenges we face in the architecture space. And so, yes, so today we're going to talk about uh, what the challenges are doing architecture work within a highly agile environment. Uh, some of the behavior changes I think that the architecture community needs to start adopting if it's going to face up some of those challenges. And throughout the group we've got a number of tools that um, we're beginning to uh, develop to help architects work in this environment. So if we just move on. So yeah. Yeah, I need to figure out where I'm going to stand. Um, so, yes, so, so a real challenge we have at the moment in a highly agile uh, environment. We've lots of talk today about innovation. And to really make the best of the innovation, we need to work in a much slicker, faster way. So, we're seeing agile being adopted across the piece in, in every industry we're working with and all of our partners. But uh, part of the challenge we have, and we're seeing increasingly, is uh, some places are working very agile. A lot of the Agile teams actually think architecture doesn't necessarily add value, so we're trying to make sure we can instill the good things that the architecture community can do, so all of the good rigor, uh, alignment that we can bring to, uh, to the table, but how do we continue to do that in an environment that is changing all the time? And if we talk about some of the challenges, we see um, highly Agile teams, uh, lots and lots of iterative development, so we're spending a lot more time getting feedback from users, so we can't really afford to spend the time building quite complex large sets of documentation because what we're seeing is that actually inhibits the agility and ultimately inhibits the uh, in innovation that we're trying to achieve. So, um, and a really good example of why we do need architecture and rigor and control on top of that is I was speaking to uh, another organization last week and we found an instance where there were two teams, two scrum teams had been set up on the same floor, more or less next to one another, and they were ultimately working on the same product, as it turned out, with no communication or collaboration or understanding that, that this was actually the case. So it is really key that we find a way of taking our you know, architecture practices and tools and making sure that we can adjust and evolve them to work in a more uh, agile environment. So uh, to start with, we're gonna, again, I'm just going to give an overview of some of the key parts of the digital transformation, and then we will go into some of the behaviors and tools that need to adjust to make that work. So over to you. Thanks, Jason. So looking at some of the typical roadmaps of how the digital transformation is being impacted by any organization or any enterprise, there's something about how they start with answering or questioning themselves first by saying, why are we actually embarking on a digital transformation program? What are we planning to deliver? And then finally, how do we deliver that? And these are some of the, you can say, the ground principles by which a transformation should happen. And in any of these aspects, the things aren't clear or fairly uncertain. They again fail to answer some of those nitty gritties of how the implementation would happen or how whether they have actually realized the benefits of any of those principles or the values that they were embarking on in the very beginning of the digital transformation strategy. What was the vision? Why do we think the business transformation would benefit from making things digitized? Are they transforming it or are they digitally enabling any of those information within their organization at all? Moving on to the next aspect, what we have looked into is these are some of those key outcomes that any organization, once they have embarked, would like to have as part of their outcomes of transformation. They would want to be more agile to serve their customers. When their needs are changing, they want to have a very, very facilitated inside out view by saying, yes, these are the needs, these are the constraints, we are happy to respond how we can make the experience, as we were speaking in some of the sessions as well, the user experience is fairly only channel, no matter which channel you're accessing the services from. How the growth is being impacted when we are more agile and responsive while reducing the overall operational costs as well. Do we really look back and understand how our behaviors are changing? How are we increasing the satisfaction and loyalty of our customers? 
Embarking on these outcomes, we always face these challenges, as I would talk about is being more responsive. How do you manage if the scopes are changing, if we're saying, yes, we would do something in a much more optimized manner, but hang on, we are not ready yet. How do we make sure that that scope is good enough to deliver value, while at the same time, whether we have the right designs in place to deliver the value that we are looking for, but at the same time, are we really embarking on the same path that we started off with? Is the traceability there of what our organization is supposed to offer? And finally, are we taking the short-term decisions that might lead to anomalous deaths of the tech, but also in the business operations as well? And eventually, the readiness of business change isn't quite there to embrace the changes or the transitions that we are all going to have together as an organization, but also as an ecosystem as well. So these are some of the challenges that we have uncovered that would always be a hindrance to some of the outcomes that the transformation would love to have. In the next coming steps, we would be looking into that, how do we see these, some of those challenges getting alleviated by following some of the basic principles of how do we look into the transformation from a design down to the delivery methodology. This is one of the high level view of what we have pulled together as part of the design and delivery strategy, starting from a target operating model, going to an implementation, which is working at more an agile atmosphere and culture, where you would have team backlogs, they are working on the products, they are releasing products via CDCI manners, but at the same time, how do we make sure that that works with the key ambitions of the backlog, how the processes are aligned, are we aligned with the specific implementation that are undergoing at a grassroots level? Some of those things that we looked into, and these are high-level themes that we are talking about here, is making sure that the strong foundations are laid so that we can't be troubleshooting any basic problems with the foundation of an architecture, whether it's a business architecture or it could be a technical architecture as well. So classic examples would be, let's take a capability which is notification. If someone is trying to be notified for any services, what is the best model you would want to go for? What exactly is the basic aspect of sending them maybe text, text and email, but can they subscribe to that? What would be the basic channel for that? Can we start with providing them with a facility where they can call in and then do that and before embarking on a self-service? So these are some of the aspects where you start layering your approaches with the business capabilities and the tech capabilities to understand which data do we need, how the data would be stored, is there any compliance and legislations that we need to look for so that when we are scaling it across multiple channels or maybe globally, we are compliant with those solutions as well. Moving into, I think one of the things that we looked into across multiple clients was fine, it's an amazing model, but how do we put it to test? How do we use it? So this was some of the things that we looked into that we start off with at a program level, creating a capability model or capability view which tells us what an organization needs to have, not how. So that the business can come and say, yes, this is what we are looking for. This is what we expect the organization to deliver across different capabilities. Then we look into how those capabilities can be implemented and there could be multiple solutions for that. This is where the solution design view comes into the picture and then having that solution growing across the organization or scaled across the organization, we look at how do we manage those dependencies. In the future slides, we will be talking about how we actually do these capability mappings and the solution design as well while still being fairly agile. And the final bit is, which is where the agile comes into action. How do we manage the product roadmaps? How do we make sure that those roadmaps are delivering the minimum, but certainly a viable product with every release? Moving on to the next bit, to summarize, we do look into what is architecture being a very, very key or core for any organization to succeed with an agile, but more transitioning space. And we always have talked about with a crawl, walk, and run strategy where you start looking into the foundational elements first to make sure that they are grounded from the design principles and then scaled in the manner we would like to have. Are they delivering the business benefits even if they are MVPs? And how do we manage the dependencies to make sure that we aren't delivering or creating anything that is bespoke? Moving to the next bit, having said that, if the architecture is the key bit, how do we want architects to behave in this kind of a culture and dynamic environment? I would hand it off to Jason to talk a bit about how an architect role is transitioning and transforming in this new dynamic space. 
So, so, in so in a moment we'll talk about some more tools that we're developing to allow um, architects to work within the kind of highly agile environment, but I think it's worth reflecting on some of the behaviours and culture shifts we need to make as a community. So um, if we think about the way it's been possible to behave as an architectural community in the past, in, in kind of large programmes, you know, very long time they're taking to deliver, uh, very hierarchical kind of programmes and organisations as well. Um, there's a lot of behaviours that can emerge, and, and we're not saying that actually all architects that work in a kind of more waterfall style have the left-hand uh, behaviours, the kind of more traditional behaviours, but it allows the architecture organisations to work in a very dictatorial fashion, so we quite often, I'm sure, have all seen environments where uh, architecture is done very large, very upfront, doesn't actually continue to develop and evolve throughout the deliveries. And so what we're trying to see is, is, is change the behaviours of the architecture communities throughout you know, both our own organisations and, and with all the architecture uh, organisations we're working with to become much more of a leadership organisation, much more focused on collaboration, much more focused on sort of value-add content, not necessarily large upfront sets of documentation. And although we've got some tools that we're going to uh, introduce briefly to um, enable the architects to work in this, in this way, it's really, really important, I think, that we change the community. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is working with the Capgemini University to try and bring some of this uh, content to uh, our own sort of training and learning. So start to embed some of the uh, agility, both in terms of behaviours and tools, in, in sort of the architecture courses that we're rolling uh, out. And so we're, we're targeting at the moment, uh, January next year is the first time we run some of the uh, agile-focused architecture courses. So moving on. Um, so we're probably running out of time. So um, just very, very quickly. So you know, it's not just Cap Gem and I that are looking at this. Obviously, the industry is trying to wrestle with um, how does architecture work in an agile fashion. So I think um, I think in July this year, I might have the date slightly out. Uh, the Open Group published a really interesting paper on how uh, architecture needs to work in an agile environment. And and of course, there are some principles that the uh, Scaled Agile Group also have. So. I'm not suggesting we dwell and talk about these in depth, but there's a lot of thinking that's out there around how architects need to change their behaviour. But actually, there still is very limited sets of tools and frameworks and support to help architects work in this way. So one of the things we've been doing is talking throughout the group. So we've been talking to some of our colleagues uh, in France and Holland and North America to say, how can we start developing some actual practical tools that are going to help people work in this way moving forward? So if we, if we move on. Gagan, move on, sorry, thank you. Um, so, and, and what we see is there's lots and lots of content emerging, and we're kind of grouping them into these three themes. Um, again, you'll have seen some content about this from, from many other people uh, online, but there's a lot of work being done around how we can define a minimum viable architecture. We're building a lot of work, as Gagan kind of explored in the digital roadmap, around how do we do a, a, an architecture roadmap we still need a roadmap, but how do we keep it lightweight and just enough to actually allow us to do all of the good things we need to do as an architecture community, but not necessarily inhibit or stagnate any of the deliveries we're talking about? And we're starting to also develop um, a number of tools, uh, planning toolkits just to allow an architect to understand this is the environment within which I'm working, um, therefore this is how um, I need to start going about doing some of my work. So we'll touch upon these very, very briefly uh, in the next two or three slides. So, so what we're looking at in terms of the minimum viable architecture is um, what is the minimum amount of work I might need to do as an architect in order to support a minimum viable product. And what's quite interesting is if you look at those kind of three themes we were talking about earlier, they align quite nicely with what the product management community is looking at. So the minimum viable architecture obviously sits alongside and informs the minimum viable product, uh, and the roadmap and the planning will also support the product that manages there as well. So what we're really trying to make happen is how do we keep things simple? How do we delay major design decisions? And so we're trying to produce some of the standard views that might help. Again, it's a framework, so this is not necessarily a prescriptive, you have to do all of these in order to do your architecture work. Uh, but we're trying to develop some tools there to help. So one of the things um, that we really think is quite interesting is starting to produce some of the DevOps views around this. So we're quite used to having quite solution-focused views. Uh, but as we discussed uh, earlier this morning in various sessions, uh, we're trying to really innovate, really get some pace into deliveries. We want to try ideas, uh, understand if they succeed or fail, potentially get lots of user feedback and, and continue to build and iterate. 
And actually, the DevOps view helps us understand where the parts of our architecture solutions might inhibit that. So just understanding across your solution which parts of the solution are quite adaptable and flexible to change and which parts in the enterprise are less likely to change because if we're being honest and realistic, we're never going to have a nice greenfield organization where everything could be truly agile. So that DevOps view is quite useful because it will allow us to understand parts of the architecture that maybe we don't want as part of the minimum viable architecture because they are you know, harder to change and shift. Maybe we want to focus on other solutions in that space. Uh, and that will allow us to actually come up with a minimum viable architect that supports a minimum viable product, but also understand where we might need to evolve and develop that solution moving forward. So we've got some tools and contents that we're beginning to um, develop there. So if we move on to the roadmap, which you're going to talk about. So one of the aspects that you always get asked to the client is, what do you mean do you by mean just by enough? Just or enough? when do we really realize that this is just enough solution or design that we have come up with that we can run with when the Agile team is working on their backlog because they would want to run with their features, epics, and they would say, yes, we, would, we don't want to focus with the scopes and the MVPs. I think design is way too upfront and it's going to take forever for us to realize that and we are going to waste a lot of time. So what we have tried to do is try to bring together some of those nuances to make sure the design complements the Agile delivery methodology. So if I look into some of the key milestones whenever any typical project starts, it starts with the initiation where you embarked on a discovery to understand what that service is about. Look into alpha where you are doing more of a prototyping. Go into the private beta where you are assessing and understanding how your operational staff with the limited availability are going to respond. And again, loop back into if there are any problems, but finally go live with that product or a solution across the organization or across the customer base. When we have these milestones, how do we realize or when do we come up with these solutions or the designs is something that we have picked up. So one of the things that we always start off with that someone was asking that, should I be when should I be creating the HLD, that's high level design? And the view was that we don't need to have that. We need to have a solution approach where you discover what exactly is business trying to establish and what would be the key possible approaches that you would have. So some of the key tools that you can possibly use is the collaboration diagram, sequence diagrams to see how the data is being interacted, which users we are looking into. And then that would suffice to what the user research needs to be taken forward with a very high level epics and creating a high level product backlog. This may come up with some of the assumptions and also my accompanying some technical spikes to assess what the solution could be because you may be very uncertain about what the possibilities are. Moving to the next bit would come up with when you have scoped and found out as part of your discovery, these are the few things that we would want to product test it. You, you would start looking into the HLD design. This is where the HLD would come handy and you would look into some of the user experience prototyping and your features would get down from epics which are high level stories. Moving to the next, these features would help you start creating your product backlog, that is sprint backlog that is used by the dev team to implement it. <coughs> and this is when we would need an HLD because that is what we would want the developers or the tech leads to have a look at before they are implementing a solution. So as you can see, we are not really going into the remit of having HLD or HLD upfront. There is a transitional or emergent architecture that we're experiencing from the progress of a project life cycle, which complements to how the epics get broken down into the features down to the sprint backlogs. And then eventually you have user stories, which the devs work on and you implement the code and go live with it. One of the things that we also looked into here is that how do we look into digital capabilities doing a product road mapping? Because this is some of the things that we did observe that many of the industry frameworks don't come up with. Example is TOGAF. They don't have an as aspect of how do you do the product road mapping. And some of those things that we advised to the clients were that technically there's no one answer to that because a lot of times what happened was it was a chicken and egg problem where you are trying to ask the business, what do you want to have? What are your requirements? And the business doesn't have an answer to that. They don't know what the solution might look like or what the requirements they would want to fulfill. And it's some, to some extent it's quite typical because a person who may be using a typewriter, if you're asking him which software should I be putting on your laptop, he may not have an answer to that. So you have to tell him that these are the capabilities 
we have. So we have a word which would help you edit your documents or what you're typing in. You can color them. Is this something that suffices to your requirement? So there is a concept of, you can say, a top-down but also bottom-up view where you start with a top-down view of what key capabilities and features you would have, take it to the business, and instead of helping them articulate, you help them validate that. But at the same time, as part of being agile in a manner, you would allow them to bottom up and prioritize them that these are the features we need with this level of a maturity. So that way you are not really investing a load of money to go in a very monolithic system but being more agile by prioritizing the value that you want to have with specific capabilities but at the feature level. And being the capabilities as one of the key elements would help you reuse the same solutions but capabilities across the organization as well. Moving on to the next one, I like Jason if he can talk a little so bit more about this really industry really one. Well, yeah. So, 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 um, so again, so it's as part of the planning toolkit. So, how does an architect go about deciding how to build that roadmap, how to um, build the um, minimum viable architecture? So, um, th again, there's lots of industry things that are out there. So, we can use the TOGA uh, architecture delivery methodology. There's lots of content online about how that can be iterated. Uh, we're doing some work with some colleagues in France who are doing some quite interesting things at the moment about how uh, we can take the TOGAF ADM and align it to the scaled agile um, uh, PI uh, process. Um, so there's lots of we're beginning to um, develop in that space. So if you move on to the next slide. Uh, we're also um, building uh, a kind of a, a, an agile uh, assessment spectrum so you can understand both the delivery you're working on and the enterprise you're delivering to um, how agile are they? Because, of course, no organization is ever going to be completely to the left or completely to the right of this spectrum. There's lots of different dynamics. Some are, you know, security. Some organizations are just very risk averse. Uh, plus, there's also, so there are some things you can't influence within the enterprise very easily, but there are also things that maybe we can start to influence. So uh, we can look at how much documentation versus content is required. How heavyweight is some of the governance? Because, again, one of the things we see is the architecture governance that's put in place is somehow counterproductive. So again, uh, talking to some colleagues who were working in this space recently, they were working with an organization who, uh, in a microservice type of environment, but they needed to go through a process in order to agree we could have extra microservices added. And the net result we saw was um, teams didn't do that. They just kept building inside the microservices. So you found like the microservice becoming a monolith, uh, anti-pattern emerging quite quickly, all because of some governance that wasn't necessarily badly intentioned, but very, very badly realized. So again, this toolkit is to help the architect understand what the environment they're working in is, uh, what they might need to influence, and how that might then begin to shape some of the roadmaps and uh, minimum viable architects we're talking about. Right, so zoom to the slide that says questions, because <laughs> I think we're running out of time. Um, so, so, so the key takeaway, I think, is is although a lot of people do believe that potentially architecture isn't needed in a very agile environment, we would say it's more important than ever before to have some degree of architecture control across your enterprise. Very, very key. We do need to change and we do need to take new tools out there in order to demonstrate uh, the value that the community adds. But, um, you know, it's hard work and a lot of people need to like, think about how they uh, evolve to get there.